this rate. <laughs>
House congregation to please stand for the order of vespers on page 229. On page 229, order of vespers. Psalm 119, sung to the tune of H, as printed in the front of your bulletin. Psalm 119, sung to the tune of H.
Please may be seated. This evening's reading comes to us from James, the third chapter and the fourth chapter. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong, you ask wrongly, to spend it on your own passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Be double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Jesus. Amen. When it comes to wisdom, yes, wisdom, we typically define wisdom as, get this, the ability to think and to act by using knowledge, experience, common sense, and insights. And so we classify wise people as those who have gone to a lot of school, those who have lived a long life, and even those who've learned a lot through the school of hard knocks, if you will. Furthermore, it seems that everyone wants this rich commodity of wisdom, but only, and only a few in life have it. For those who apparently have it, they will give it away for, well, a price. All one has to do is scan the New York Times bestseller list or turn on the television to watch a daytime interview show to see who the latest wise person is, who the most learned person is, making a cheap buck. To glean a bit of their valuable wisdom, you can buy their latest book, you can subscribe to their newest gimmick, you can subscribe to their podcast, their YouTube channel, and so forth. You can purchase their most recent invention, and shazam, you've added wisdom to your arsenal in life. So with that said, I ask you this evening, are you wise? Do you possess wisdom? Who among you is truly wise in this sanctuary tonight? You see, James is addressing in our epistle reading from this evening some of the people in the ancient church who were setting themselves up as being wise and learned in the church. Up on a pedestal they sat, 
with their so-called wisdom. Now, let it be said that this is indeed needed in a church. We do need wisdom in a church. Older men and older women should be temperate, serious, prudent, and sound in the faith so that they may encourage younger Christians. However, and this is a big however, this is not James' main concern. This is not the concern that he addresses this evening. He's not confronting the honoring of godly wisdom, but instead, he's directing his concern to those who are setting themselves up as wise, while simultaneously holding to a phony wisdom itself. Actually, you heard in the scripture tonight, a demonic wisdom, which is no wisdom at all. Now, dear friends, it is good to talk about wisdom. It's good to look to the wise in our lives. And it's good to desire to be wise yourself. However, if we do all of this and fail to recognize what the wisdom is sourced in or where it comes from, we're not wise, but fools, fools at best. This is the Apostle James' concern for us this evening. Otherwise stated, James is showing us that there are two kinds of wisdom in this life. There's a wisdom from God, and there's a wisdom that's earthly, that's unspiritual. Again, he actually calls it demonic wisdom. And so the question at hand for us is this, what wisdom do we subscribe to? What wisdom do we embrace? First, let us consider the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God, yes, that wisdom of God is, well, from God himself. It's from above. It's actually revealed to you and me from heaven, which means that it does not come from the human heart. It does not reside right here. It's not something you can conjure up from within. It has to come from the outside in. You see, the Holy Spirit, through the Word, is the one that teaches and gives you this wisdom. And this happens as you and I are faithing in Jesus and Christ's work on our behalf. And so we are given this wisdom as we're shaped not by our experiences, not by our heart, not by our feelings, but as we're shaped by the Word of God. As indeed, we're shaped by the Word of God. It also happens when our sinful natures, well, when our sinful natures are crucified yet again and again, drowned in this font, in this baptismal font, in our baptismal waters, yet again and again and again. And as we're resurrected daily in the strength of the gospel. This godly wisdom is neither from, again, the world, nor from our personal experiences or classroom studies. You cannot learn it from a book. Well, you can. The book. You see, it does not come from your effort. It does not come from your age. Rather, this wisdom that James references is from above. It is from the holy will of God. It is his holy word for you. More specifically, this wisdom of God is pure. In other words, there's nothing fishy added to it. It seeks the welfare of others, this wisdom of God. This wisdom is not concerned with the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I, but it focuses on the need of others, serving others. For example, this wisdom teaches us, and this hurts to hear this, this wisdom teaches us that we will actually give in for the sake of the other person. This wisdom teaches us that when we're driving, we don't have to cuss out the other driver when we are cut off. This wisdom teaches us that an employee can carry out his boss's demands without sputtering underneath his breath or talking behind his boss's back. This wisdom teaches us that students don't have to put down a loner in the classroom in order to stay popular and on the top. This wisdom teaches us that siblings don't have to argue about whose turn it is to pick up the living room or clear off the table. This wisdom is real. It's not some abstract idea. I think it's safe to say <clears throat> that when we think about this wisdom from God, we can all agree that this is the way that it should, should simply be, that this is the way that it simply should be. There's a sense of peace in this wisdom that causes us to say, you know, that wisdom, that sounds good. Wouldn't it be nice if we could all have this? It'd be like heaven on earth. So my friends, why? Aren't things peaceable? Why do the world, the church, and families not live in this blissful state of wisdom that is selfless and serving of another? And the reason is that we follow empty wisdom. We follow empty wisdom. Practically speaking, 
how do we know when we are drinking the Kool-Aid of empty wisdom, which is the opposite of this godly wisdom? Well, we can be assured that we follow the ways of empty wisdom when the wisdom is Christless or godless. You see, empty wisdom is actually earthly. It points you and me to what is observable in the world while giving no acknowledgement to the living awareness of God. And so it focuses only on what we can see in this veil of tears without any acknowledgement of God himself, the one who intervenes in this world. And so this earthly wisdom is nearsighted. It only recognizes mankind and nothing more. It is also demonic. It calls evil good and good evil. It denies the Lord. It hates actually the gospel itself. It exalts sin. It condemns goodness and it brings hell itself. This empty wisdom is the reason for the divisions and conflicts and disputes in the world, in the government, the community, the church, the home, and within you and me. This empty wisdom goes the way of the sinful nature. In other words, any time there are divisions in the church, it is due to empty wisdom, colliding with godly wisdom, or perhaps just a bunch of empty wisdom bumping into each other. And so anytime there are divisions and conflicts in the family, in the government, the workplace, and in your life, it is due to empty wisdom that spews forth lies and deceit. Tragically, though, instead of pointing to this empty wisdom as the culprit, <clears throat> as the one to blame, and the foolishness of us following this empty wisdom, the temptation for all of us, myself included, is to point to anything else but ourselves as the reason for the conflict and the dispute. We want to blame others. We blame our spouse. We blame the culture. We blame our history. We blame others. We, we try and shift everything away from ourselves. And this is the way. That's the way of empty wisdom. Empty wisdom teaches us that the problem is, well, it's outside of us. And the solution, well, the solution, oh, it's right here. Problem's out there somewhere, but the solution is right here. At the same time, the scriptures show us that the problem is actually not out there. It's right here. And the solution, it's outside of us, right here. Frankly, empty wisdom only yields a life full of bitterness, envy, selfish ambitions. The empty wisdom is not of God, but it is demonic, as James has told us. It is not of the spirit, but it is unspiritual. This empty wisdom springs forth not from faith, but from evil intent. It brings disorder, wickedness, disunity, and chaos. At this point in the sermon, I'm sure that you're recognizing the malady and the problem of this empty wisdom and the blessedness of godly wisdom. And so you might be saying to yourself, get this, this is what I would say. You know, I better reject this empty wisdom and I better work harder at demonstrating godly wisdom in my thoughts, words, and deeds. I better stop this and do this. But we need to stop. You see, what has just happened here, without even knowing it, we just reverted back to, well, empty wisdom. You see, we're looking at ourselves again. You see, wisdom is not sourced in me stopping to do this and then me doing this. The source does not start here. James says that well, God imposes the proud, and that is exactly what pride does. Pride says, I can stop doing this, and I'll start doing this, and that's pride at work. And so, my friends, you can't do wisdom. You cannot do it. The reason, be the reason being is God opposes this arrogance. So what do we do? What needs to happen? Well, what needs to happen is that our sinful nature that curves inward on itself towards empty wisdom... It actually needs to be crucified. Empty wisdom needs to be exposed. Our sinful nature that clings to this empty wisdom needs to actually die. Our selfish desires, our self-centeredness, our struggles within, all of this, all of these ideas, this worldly ideology, all the satanic lies, they all need to be crucified, put to death. That old sinful nature needs to die today, tomorrow, and every single day. We need to be brought to repentance and humility. And so, amid the repentance 
and the rubble of this empty wisdom that lay before you and me, we need to hear some good news. You see, God has had mercy on you in Christ. Surely God opposes the proud, <clears throat> but you and I are humbled by our mess of sin caused by empty wisdom. Each and every one of us are. And then we're given forgiveness and grace and wisdom from above, from a gracious God, again and again and again. Yes, hear the good news. God in his great wisdom forgives you and me of our empty wisdom. As his children, there's an avalanche of undeserved grace and forgiveness for you and me who peddle soft, peddle empty wisdom. Furthermore, God wants you not bound to the deception of empty wisdom, but rather the Lord God himself, as his children, as his children, he actually, actually wants to bind you to him and his word so that you can be consistently led by the Holy Spirit as he gives you godly wisdom as a free gift by his word, poured into your ears, showered upon your mind. You see, it comes down to this, to know Christ and him crucified is to know God's wisdom. And so hear this, baptized saints, tonight. You have Christ, thus you have godly wisdom when you have Jesus. You see, baptized saints, this wisdom teaches you that you have been delivered from the condemnation of sin, death, and the devil. This godly wisdom teaches us that so we do not fear. This godly wisdom shows you and me that we have been ravished by the forgiveness of sins in Christ, that we have been pardoned. This wisdom of the gospel reveals to you that you are adopted as God's son and daughter. You are fully accepted. This wisdom makes it known to you that the Lord God has done absolutely everything that is necessary for your salvation that you can receive, that you do receive by faith as a gift. This wisdom teaches you to freely and joyfully with all of your heart and with all an eager will to serve your neighbor because you've been served first and foremost by Christ. This wisdom teaches you that you don't have to worry, worry whether a person is a friend or an enemy or to worry if they're going to be thankful or not. Rather, you are allowed to spend yourself and all that you have without strings attached because Christ spent his blood for you. That is that godly wisdom. This wisdom tells you not to worry about whether you squander your love towards those who are ungrateful for you have love already. This wisdom shares that God has taken care of your salvation for you. Thus, you can rest in his sure promises. This wisdom shows you that you are completely free of everything, that you are a servant of all, completely attentive to the needs of all because of Christ and this wisdom he bestows upon you. So, my dear friends, you have been given Christ, who is wisdom from above, all of this is yours, all as a gift given to you, yes, from his word, freely bestowed upon you again and again and again. In the name of Jesus, who made, who has made wisdom to us from God. Amen. I ask you to please stand for the Menefikot. Let my prayer rise before you as incense.
Yogesh, you may be safe for the offering music. to please stand for the Kyrie on 233. as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let's pray. Almighty God, and unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may be perfectly loved, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you resist the proud and give grace to the humble. Grant us true humility after the likeness of your only Son, that we may never be arrogant and prideful, and thus provoke your wrath, but in all lowliness be made partakers of the gifts of your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, grant your unworthy servants your grace, that in the hour of our death the adversary may not prevail against us, but that we may be found worthy of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, Lighten our darkness, O Lord, and by your great mercy, defend us from all the perils and dangers of this night. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused a holy scripture to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Maybe see if our closing hymn, hymn number 430, hymn number 430.